Welcome to Food Slain. My name is Michelle and I am your host. And today we're talking about country of origin labeling laws. Now, I personally have been interested in learning more about how these laws work, especially since there's such a large percentage of our food coming from other countries. We import a lot of food from around the world, here in the US, that is. And I felt like it would be good to just understand how these laws work, where they fail, and what that means for us as consumers. Food labels serve as a real purpose for consumer education. They tell us about the healthfulness and the nutritional benefits of the product that we're about to consume, or at least they should. And food labeling is regulated in the US by the FDA. And the companies that produce our food, both fresh or raw, cooked, processed, and packaged, are required to adhere to these mandatory laws and requirements if they want to sell to U.S. customers. So today, we're going to glaze over a few of the different types of labeling laws, but for the most part, we're going to focus on country of origin labeling laws. Now, these laws, also referred to as COOL, COOL laws, which is an acronym, of course, cover mostly fresh foods, you know, from fruits and vegetables and some meat products like fish. And what I found to be interesting about cool laws are there are products that we consume to the tune of billions of pounds that are exempt from these laws. But why? That's always the question, isn't it? Why? Now, these are mandatory federal laws upheld by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, so why would some of our most vulnerable food products be exempt? Well, that's a good question. And we're going to understand why by the end of this episode. But before we put on our cool detective goggles, I want to thank my loyal patrons for supporting this podcast. Thank you so much. I also want to thank my new subscribers, to the Food Slain newsletter. Thanks for joining us over there. You know, so glad to see more people, more food sleuths out there signing up for the exclusive podcast newsletter. And you can too. Just head over to foodslain.com and sign up for the updates and exclusive food safety content that you won't find anywhere else. So if this is the first time that you're hearing my voice, Welcome to Food Slain, and I hope that you stick around, or at the very least, you share these episodes with people that you love, because here, we dig into our food supply so that we can free our food from corporate control, chemical contamination, and marketing manipulation. I also want to thank my new listeners in Mexico and in Sweden. Gracias and taque, or taquel. I think is how you say that in Swedish. I'm not Swedish, so I don't know. So all of my Swedish fans, hook me up with a language tutorial. And let's give these laws a goo, shall we? So one of the drivers of doing this work for me was knowing where my food was coming from. I was a younger me, of course, just out of college, and I totally got bit by the better nutrition bug. Now this was a time when fads like the macrobiotic diet and the eat right for your blood type diets were all the rage. And if you don't remember that time, then that means you're probably under the age of 35 as this was the mid 1990s. So I began digging into food issues in the early 90s because I was concerned about the quality of the food I was purchasing even though back then I wasn't really a meat eater, really, you know, because I gave up meat cold turkey in 1991 for over 25 years, but I knew that there was something nefarious going on with our, our food supply, or at least that's what I thought, you know. I, I just had a feeling that something that I didn't know anything about was going on in our food supply. And, I, of course, at that time... I didn't know exactly what was going on, but 
you know, like I said, I knew there was, there was just something gnawing at me. And by the time I was well on my way to understanding the bigger picture, I had become a raw food chef at a high-end vegetarian restaurant in New York City, and I was running a juice and smoothie delivery service, and I was teaching healthy food prep classes. But the thing is, I was always really conscientious about where and who I purchased food ingredients from. Now, me personally, I, at that time, I was a part of a CSA in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and I was a member of one of the largest food co-ops in the U.S., the Park Slope Food Co-op. Big shout out to them. Love that place. Had such great experiences at the Park Slope Food Co-op in Brooklyn. And I also shopped at what I thought were stores that carried local food and better products. And then in the early 2000s, like everyone else, I began to shop at Whole Foods because I wanted to shop with retailers that had food and safety standards that were similar to my own. And I trusted them. And many of us did. And many of us still do. But I have to say, once Whole Foods was purchased by Jeff Bezos, I broke up with Whole Foods. That's, that was it. <laughs> but that's another story for another day. Now, from there, I continued digging into the food supply chain, always reading labels and learning more and uncovering inconvenient truths about what I was eating and what I was urging my food consulting clients to eat. And then 2014 happened. It was the year I started questioning my own well-being after a few life catastrophes, you know, that happens when when things fall apart, sometimes you just have to step back and you got to look at things and you got to reassess. But in 2013, I heard firsthand about how Whole Foods was preparing to stand up for and promote GMO labeling laws. And that's really where the labeling laws thing kind of entered the picture for me. And the good news is there are labeling laws, many of them, and ones that cover genetically modified ingredients, which, you know, these laws that Whole Foods was championing for actually go into effect next year. That's exciting. So the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standards, the NBFDS, was published in the Federal Register in December of 2018. And that was the start, the beginning of mandatory GMO labeling in the United States. So in 2022, manufacturers will be required to label products containing GMOs. Hip, hip, hooray. I know I'm one of those people. I want to know if I'm eating GMO, you know, products. I, I want to know if they're in there. You know, I talked about this particular issue in one of my episodes. I can't remember which one it is right now, but I was talking about how um, there, you know, GMOs hide in a lot of our packaged food products because companies are not required to uh, include GMO ingredients if they account for less than a certain percentage of the total food ingredients. And so in a lot of cases, although there may not be an obvious GMO ingredient in the product, there might be uh, an ingredient of that ingredient in the product. So for example, vegetable oils, right? Uh, many of the inputs to vegetable oils, whether they're canola, sunflower, or soybean oil, um, you know, they're not required to say that the, the oils are GMO on the label. Anyway, but I digress. But there are FDA labeling requirements for other foods in our food supply, like fruits and vegetables. And so here are some of the regulations um, that the labels must contain. And this is from usacustomsclearance.com. The label must contain the name and address of the shipper, 
the name of the product, a net content statement in traditional terms like bushels, quantity, or weight, the full chemical names of all pesticides and their purposes, the full chemical names of all post-harvest food additives and their purposes, including waxes, resins, and other similar materials, end quote. Now, these are rules for the shipping containers, right? Retail products have different requirements. So individual labels on retail containers like, you know, mesh bags or clamshell packaging, they must contain at least the following. The name of the product, the name and address of the packer or distributor, the net weight, and the ingredient statement, which includes post-harvest food additives. Now, interestingly, the disclosure of pesticide and chemical information is not required to appear on the retail label, <laughs> which... You know, if you're asking me, I'd rather know what the chemicals are on my fruit. I would rather know that. But I know that a lot of people don't care or don't want to know. I mean, it's, you know, imagine what that would do to sales. You know, that would, that would impact sales quite significantly, I imagine. But one of the most important labels that I look for on fruits and vegetables are those little stickers either directly on the fruit or they're attached by like a rubber band or uh, one of those twist ties in the case of bunches of something. And, you know, I look for the numbers or, or, or you know, the words exactly that say it's organically produced, right? Um... So I try to strictly purchase fruits and veggies, of course, when I'm not growing them myself, with labels that start with the number nine and are five digits, which means it was organically grown. And I prefer to buy food that was produced locally or at least produced in the United States. So when I have to shop at the grocery store for fruits and vegetables, I look for a five-digit uh, you know, sticker on it that usually typically starts with a number nine, which denotes that that is an organically grown product. Now, if it starts with an eight, but it's also a five digit number, that means it was genetically engineered or it's GMO. If it's a four digit number, it's been conventionally grown, which typically means it contains and or has been exposed to chemical pesticides. So, the label, any of those labels, also must say where it was grown. So whether you purchase a tomato in December from Mexico or you buy a cucumber in February from Honduras, it must be included on the label, which is great, right? Because it gives customers like you and me a chance to know where our fruits and vegetables are coming from because we should know where our food is coming from right? So it's mandatory for many other industries, including the clothing industry, electronics, fruit, seafood, and almost anything else that you buy at the grocery store. It also has to be labeled where it was manufactured or produced. But there are a couple of things that we eat that are exempt from mandatory country of origin labeling laws. Like I mentioned in the last episode, if you listened to it on food recalls, it was interesting that the ingredient that seemed to be the primary cause of the recall wasn't even recalled. And if you didn't listen to that episode, I highly recommend that you check it out. You can go over to foodslain.com and listen to that one. But what this says to me is that finished products do have to have an ingredients label, right? If it's in a box or package or whatever, it's got to have an ingredients label. Um, but companies are not required to disclose from where or from whom they purchase these ingredients. So the example in the food recall episode, the product was beef with gravy and it was in a can, right? Turns out it was contaminated with lead, which was traced back to the spice supplier. I mean, most people don't even know that lead is in their spices anyway. That is, of course, 
unless they listen to this podcast or my episode on turmeric, right? So even if the country of origin for the ingredients were included on the product, it probably wouldn't matter to most people, right? And even from a design standpoint, all of the information would never fit on that little label, right? But the point here is, not to get too sidetracked, the point is, is that, you know, these, these labeling laws, whether, um, whatever type of product it is, typically has to, you know, say where it was manufactured, like the company brand name is on it, or at least say who is the distributor. And, you know, if it's recalled, then, you know, they eventually find out, oh, well, you know, it was caused because of this or because of that, or maybe it was an ingredient that came from this other country. But we as consumers don't get to have that, that gritty information on the food label. Okay, so let's put that aside just for a moment. And I want to talk about a little bit of history, because you know I like to get into history. <laughs> so these cool laws, they started in 1930, and it, they were a part of the Tariff Act. And it stated, quote, that every article of foreign origin imported into the United States shall be marked with its country of origin, end quote. Simple, right? 1930, the Tariff Act, which, you know, was all about, like, international trade, right? That every article of foreign origin imported into the U.S. shall be marked with its country of origin. Simple. We need to know where things are coming from. Somewhere along the line, the law, as it applies to meat, changed. So beef is required to bear a label denoting the foreign country of origin of the beef all the way to the consumer unless the beef undergoes a substantial transformation in the U.S. So the operative word there is substantial. <laughs> there was a moment in history when cattle were raised by family cattle ranchers and those animals were processed locally and, and locally distributed, right? And, you know, most of the butchers and butcher shops at that time knew the farmer. They knew where the beef was coming from. And then, you know, of course, things changed. Trade agreements came into the picture, NAFTA, and we got ourselves wrapped up in this global food supply chain where we can barely trace ingredients back to their country of origin, let alone back to an actual specific farm. But let's keep learning about what the substantial transformation means. And it means that an animal was raised or slaughtered someplace else, and then it was imported into the U.S. as either a live carcass or a post-mortem carcass, and then it was butchered, packaged at a USDA-inspected facility in the United States, so therefore it can be labeled as a product of the USA right? Air quotes, product of the USA. And I just want you to think back for a second to your most recent trip to the grocery store when you purchased, let's say, uh, some beef or pork. And you probably saw a sticker on it that said product of the USA. Whether you noticed it or not, it was there. You know, it was probably there. And it was subliminally, it might have given you some satisfaction that you are purchasing a product of the U.S. But here's where things go sideways. In 2015, the World Trade Organization and the U.S. Congress ruled alongside with the USDA that they would no longer enforce these laws that exempted beef, pork, and turkey products, essentially repealing cool laws for these types of meat products. What was happening was and still is, by the way, cattle are being imported from all over the world at 
at very low prices, which obviously doesn't help competition. And meat packers are the ones who control the landscape. Now, of course, we talk about who these companies are. I feel like we talk about them all the time. Companies like JBS, Cargill, and Tyson, they unilaterally decide who to purchase their inputs from without much oversight, and clearly they're not beholden to these country of origin labeling laws. So the labels that you see on beef and pork, but especially beef, you'll see something like USDA Choice, USDA Prime, but that doesn't mean that the beef in that package is from an animal that was raised in the United States. Turns out, 75% of beef labeled as grass-fed now, this is important. This is important because there are, are a lot of companies and, and products entering the market right now, especially beef products, ground beef products, steaks, all kinds of beef products that are labeled as grass-fed. It is a new kind of marketing, you know, greenwashing, healthier, you know, you get a healthier perception if you think that it's grass-fed, right? But 75% of the beef labeled as grass-fed is most often imported from, guess where? Australia, New Zealand, or Uruguay. But it's labeled as, guess what? Product of the USA. So, I mean, really, what, what do we make of that? 75% of the meat labeled as grass-fed is coming from Australia, New Zealand, Uruguay. But it's labeled as a product of the USA. How are consumers supposed to be able to figure that out? Because <laughs> it's not on the label. Clearly, there is a consumer deception going on here, and it's harming not only, you know, rural communities of farmers and ranchers, but it's disintegrating consumer trust. Well, you know, I speak for myself. You can decide what it's doing to you. But I found an interesting post on a website called r-calfusa.com talking about these mandatory labeling laws. And... Quote, it is not just the non-disclosure of origin information that harms both consumers and cattle producers by frustrating the competitive process, but also consumers are being outright deceived in two ways. First, a prominent U.S. or USDA inspection sticker is affixed to every package of beef sold at retail, including on all imported beef. Lacking other origin information, the only origin information available to consumers is the prominent U.S. or USDA sticker, which clearly and erroneously implies to unsuspecting consumers that the beef is of U.S. origin. Second, the USDA has established internal policy guidelines to allow U.S. packers to mislabel beef derived derived from Mexican and Canadian cattle today, and unless cool is reinstated, Australian, Brazilian, and Colombian cattle tomorrow. The USDA guidelines allow beef to bear a product of the USA country of origin label if the beef is simply processed in the United States. Today that means all the beef from the approximately 2 million head of live cattle imported each year from Canada and Mexico, including cattle imported for immediate slaughter that are not fed or grazed in the U.S. and which will produce about one and a half billion pounds of beef can be labeled as a USA product. This is the case even if the animals spent their entire lifetimes in a foreign country except for the transportation time to a U.S.-based slaughtering plant, end quote. 
The Post goes on to describe how the repeal of cool laws manipulates the market. They say, quote, Domestic farmers and ranchers witness firsthand the impact that imported cattle from which meat is indistinguishable have on their domestic cattle prices. Within just five months from the 2003 date that Canadian live cattle imports were banned from the United States because of mad cow disease was detected in Canada, U.S. fed cattle prices jumped an unprecedented 26 per CWT, or about $325 per head. The fact that this occurred even though Canadian cattle represented only about 5% of the U.S. annual slaughter volume reveals just how ultra-sensitive the U.S. cattle industry is to even slight changes in supplies, a factor that the packers can fully exploit when cool is unavailable to consumers in the retail marketplace, end quote. So all that to say, the deception, because of this brand value that USDA marked beef or product of the USA or US, any, any kind of, you know, denotation that it might have been produced in the USA carries a lot of weight with consumers, right? But when you peel the layers back on this deception, you realize that, you know, this beef, you know, grass-fed beef, 75% of it wasn't even raised in the United States, even though it has a product of the USA sticker on it. And then, you know, what it's doing to the market is, you know, is related to the same kind of perception, right? That Canadian beef only accounts for 5% of the beef market, but prices when mad cow disease hit that, that country, right? It hit Canada, the world heard about it, cattle prices skyrocketed. So what's interesting here is that The opposition to the issue is often saying that these laws don't matter. Beef is beef. It's indistinguishable, right? Like, eh, we don't, you know, just put a product of the USA label on it and it's fine. (laughs) You can't really tell the difference between a steak from a cow raised in the U.S. or from a cow raised in Australia. You know, who can, who can tell, right? And, and a lot of these you know, proponents of the repeal of the cool laws also complain about how these laws, if they were to be reinstated, would create, and I quote, increased record keeping for upstream producers. Like what? Really? What does that tell you? It tells me that consumers aren't worth the work that it would take to differentiate the origin of meat products in the market. I mean, who wants to pay someone to keep track of all the billions of pounds of meat? Uh, Clearly, they don't. It's not important. A steak is a steak, period, right? Everybody's fine with that. But here's the kicker, and this really blew me away. Amazon and Walmart two of the largest global companies oppose these laws. And as online retailers, they are not required to comply with them. They don't have to put country of origin, you know, labels on their products. They don't have to, right? Online retailers do not have to comply to cool laws as it stands as of this recording. So, now that you have all of that information, where does that leave us as consumers of meat products? It leaves us in the dark, eating ground beef made from who knows how many cows from who knows where. And if you eat burgers from your favorite burger joint, then this impacts you. If you buy pork ribs from Costco, this impacts you. If you get your Thanksgiving turkey from the grocery store and not from someone 
like me per se, or a local farmer, this impacts you. The repeal of these laws in the beef, pork, and turkey industry means a greater economic divide between urban and rural communities. And maybe you don't care about rural communities because you live in the city, right? (laughs) Now, I used to live in the city, and I, I remember a time when I didn't care about rural life. But that's changed because now I know more. I know more about what happens in rural communities. There typically is less economic, you know, trade and commerce in in small communities. People don't have as much expendable income in rural communities. So the impacts hit harder in rural communities. But even if you don't care, it will impact you because if local folks can't afford to produce healthier food and even compete with the market or survive the manipulation, the deception continues anyway. Prices go up anyway. Local economies diminish anyway. And while these global companies rake in bigger and bigger profits year over year, right? What happens to the food on your plate? What happens to your grocery bill at the end of every month? We see it happening right now. We are in an inflationary curve. Meat prices are the highest that they've ever been. Right? So what are we paying for? We're paying for deception. We're paying for, you know, the beef industry to be exempt from from these country of origin labeling laws. We're experiencing food recalls, you know, like, I I don't know. I'll I'll let you decide what you want to do about that. And I'd be going out on a limb, but I imagine you know, to add insult to injury, that these animals that we're importing and putting a product of the USA label on them don't live their best lives being transported all over the world from country to country just to be slaughtered. And we haven't even, you know, talked about the environmental impacts of this whole system, right? I mean, seriously, there's enough cattle in the United States for us to meet our, you know, meat requirements, I would imagine. But maybe there aren't, right? Let, let's just assume that there aren't. And, you know, we need to import beef for some reason because our consumption is so high. But I, I just can't imagine that we, we can't produce enough cattle and beef products in the United States to to meet our needs. The problem is is we're exporting a lot of our our meat, right? (laughs) I don't know. It's complicated. That's what I'm getting to. It's complicated. You know, I think the whole problem with the whole, country of origin labeling laws primarily is the deception. It stinks. I don't like it. I don't like being lied to. and You know that about me. And maybe you don't like being lied to either. And my guess is this deception is very closely linked to the lobbyist problem and the lobbyists around the beef industry and how, you know, it's feeding the Congress and the USDA kind of corruption, you know, <laughs> channels, you know, in the system. Because Congress, our, the United States Congress is voting against enforcement of these laws for these products. And it makes you just wonder why. Right? Why? I understand that the beef industry is big business. You know, the live cattle industry is big business, or at least it used to be. I think it still is. I think the beef industry is a pretty big business. And I posted this video the other day that Vox did about the live cattle industry and how these farmers are getting the shaft from these huge meat packers when it comes to, you know, live cattle auctions 
And it was pretty interesting, you know, and, and there's clearly a confluence of factors coming together here, right? That, that will likely have a lasting impact on, on one of America's most profitable and longstanding industries, which is the beef industry, right? We're, we're experiencing an increase in prices. We're experiencing an increase in, in feed prices, right, in the market. We're experiencing, um, you know, the pandemic kind of put a strain on the supply chain. You know, there's all these cargo ships off the, co- off the coast of California kind of slowing things down. We're seeing inflation. Like, there's all these things. We're seeing a rise in local meat, right? There, there are many states that are uh, starting to um, secure funding for, you know, small meat inspection, state inspection facilities for local farmers so that they can kind of get out of the, that, that loop and keep more of the money in the community. So, I mean, there, there's just a lot of things at play here. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit and you could probably figure this out <laughs> if you listen to this podcast, but I'm not a fan of industrialized food. It, you know, in most cases, it just isn't a healthier option, but it is usually cheaper thanks to subsidies and economies of scale that a lot of these corporations take advantage of. But I know that there are many people who completely rely on industrially produced food. In fact, millions of people rely on it every day for calories, for convenience, for cost benefits. And I get it. That's why this is such a conundrum. So it brings us to what can we do if we want to know where our food comes from, especially when we're talking about meat products. We know what we can do with fruits and vegetables. For the most part, it's pretty transparent. But when it comes to beef, pork, and turkey, and we're coming up on Thanksgiving, folks, so, you know, um, I, I, I highly encourage you to support a local farmer and get your turkey if you can. You know, small farmers have, have constraints, so they can only produce so many. So hopefully you can still get yourself a turkey that isn't, you know, whatever, mass-produced. But if you eat you know, beef, pork, or turkey, try to buy meat from local farmers. And I know this isn't going to solve the cool laws problem, but you'll eat a healthier product for the most part, and you'll likely have better health outcomes, and your local economy will, you know, have better resilience and possibly even thrive, you know? And here's the best part, is you won't be subjected to food deception because the truth of the matter is, Most small farmers want to be transparent. They want you to know what they're doing. They want you to see the benefit of all the hard work that they're doing. They want you to know. They want to be honest and truthful. So, you know, that's where I'm going to end this one. Now we have a better understanding of our country of origin labeling laws in the United States. A lot of these labeling laws are very different in other countries. You know, they're much more strict, (laughs) which is really interesting. But, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop, you know, buying beef? Probably not. Are you going to stop buying pork? Probably not. But I think we can do better. In fact, I know we can do better. We can do better by our farmers. We can do better in the industry. We can keep more of our money in the community, we can do better. And so I hope that you share this episode with someone that you love. Someone that you love who eats pork, who eats beef, who eats turkey, right? And it's good to just know what's going on. Because at the end of the day, without cool laws, you know, required for our meat products, the deception will continue. And so with that, I hope you 
have a good rest of the week. I hope you eat something that's honest. (laughs) Try to eat something that's honest. And we're coming down to the end of season seven. And that's very exciting because that means I get to take a break. Uh, But it also means that we've got to think about season eight. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to sign up for the newsletter because I'm going to be sending out a survey. And I want you to tell me what you want to hear about. So there's that. And of course, we're going to dig into some really interesting things as the last you know, couple of episodes. I think, I think next week we're going to talk about okra toxins. And maybe you've never heard of that. And I'm not talking about okra the vegetable. But we're going to dig into it because they're all over our cereal. <laughs> and as someone who enjoys cereal from time to time. This was kind of stunning. So anyway, have a good one. Take care of yourselves out there. Remember to eat clean. Dig into your food supply chain. And let's free our food from corporate control, chemical contamination, and marketing manipulation. And I will see you on the other side of the planet. Ciao.